This presentation is called What is W from Hamilton's Rule to Axelrod's Rule, Part 3. So for this final leg, we're going to answer two questions, probably three, but we'll say two. One, why is tit for tat such a celebrated strategy in the Prisoner's Dilemma game? And secondly, what difference does W make to the success of tit for tat? So let's think about this. We were using W equal to 50% in the prior presentations because it made it easy to compare Axelrod's rule to Hamilton's rule. But we don't have to assume that. So W could be 99% or 1%. It could be very large or very small. We could make it 90% or 10%. So let's set W equal to 90% now. And then we're going to take a shortcut. So we're not going to add up all the fractions to solve the infinite series and come up with our total. Instead, we're going to use a shortcut, a formula that does the same thing for us without having to add up all the fractions. And in the denominator, we have 1 minus w. And remember that w is a number smaller than 1, although it can be as close to 1 as we want it to be. And the numerator is whatever the earnings are for that uh, particular cell in the payoff matrix, and by earnings we mean the initial earnings. So for example, the reward for cooperating is initially 2, and the penalty for defecting is initially 1. So are you ready? Here we go. If W equals 90%, how many points will an all-C earn from meeting another all-C over and over and over and over and over again. But what we do is we put 1 minus w in the denominator and the reward in the numerator. The reward is 2, and since w is 90%, w is 0.9. And so what we have to do is subtract 0.9 from 1, and that gives us 0.1, and then we divide that into 2. And when we do that, this, we get 20. And this is how many points two all C players could earn if W was 90%. They could earn eight points when W was 50%. As W increases to 90%, now they can earn 20 points. So here's another example. Again, W is 90%. How many points will an all-D strategy earn for meeting another all-D strategy over and over and over again? Well, it's the same formula. 1 minus W in the denominator, and now the penalty for defecting in the numerator. That penalty starts out at 1, and the denominator is 1 minus 0.9, which is 0.1. And 0.1 goes into 1 10 times. So in our earlier example, when W was 50%, two all-D players could earn 4 points. Now they can earn 10. So let's tally this up. The two all-C players come out with a total of 20 points after playing again and again against each other. And the two all-D players come out with 10 and so when W is set at 90%, if we keep these strategies segregated from one another so that cooperators are only meeting cooperators and defectors are only meeting defectors, then the cooperators have the upper hand. But of course, in a mixed social situation where there are both cooperators and defectors, and this is the nature of all human societies, it's not going to work out that way. So when we're looking at all C and all D, using W to do our calculations doesn't change what we did in our earlier presentations. It makes the math more rigorous. 
but we get the same outcomes, and this includes when an all C player meets an all D player. And of course, when that happens, the all C player cooperates and the all D player defects. And in that case, the cooperator gets nothing and the defector gets three. And if we assume that W is 50% again, and all C meets all D repeatedly, well, how's this going to come out over the long run? It's easy to figure it out for all C because all C always gets zero and 50% of zero is still zero. But for all D, the infinite series is going to add up to six. And who has the higher reproductive success? Well, in the situation where defectors are meeting cooperators, and every time they play, a defector meets a cooperator, the defector is going to come out with the greater reproductive success. So we can say, and this holds from our earlier example, that if our social universe has only two possible strategies, all C and all D, and all D starts out dominant so that all the players in the universe are defectors initially, and then a mutation occurs causing there to be one cooperator, that one cooperator isn't going to be able to get anything started because they're immediately going to be wiped out by all of the defectors around them. And so in the case of a universe where there's only two strategies, all C and all D, all D is what's called an evolutionarily stable strategy because it can resist invasion by all C and no all C mutation could ever get started. If on the other hand, we have a universe with two strategies, all C and all D, and initially everybody is all C, and then a mutation occurs and a defector is born, that defector can invade. And that's because each time that defector meets an all C, the defector is going to score three offspring and the cooperator is going to receive none and so we expect that defector to spread or the defecting strategy to spread through that cooperative universe. And the only thing that's going to hold it at bay is if the cooperators can keep interacting with one another rather than with the defectors. So all C in this instance is not an evolutionarily stable strategy because it's easily invaded by all D. So why then are we bothering to explain W uh, when the final results seem so similar to what we came up with when we did not use W? And the answer is W solves two problems. And the first is called the problem of backward induction. And this works off of uh, the principle of the lame duck. So a good example of W is in this particular photo, when W was in the last months in office, W couldn't get much done politically because everybody knew they wouldn't be interacting with George W as a president much longer. And of course now uh, Barack Obama is in the same lame duck position. But backward induction argues that we can just move back from that. So we know that in the future we're going to meet some other player for the final time. And when we meet for the final time, we might as well play the game as a one-shot prisoner's dilemma and defect. Backward induction says that when we say, well, we might as well do that on the second to last game, and we might as well do that on the third to the last game, and the fourth and the fifth, and presumably, despite meeting each other again and again, we never choose anything other than to treat it as a one-shot prisoner's dilemma. Well, W, because it discounts each additional meeting, if it does that appropriately, then we don't have that issue of backward induction. Now, the second problem is more germane uh, to what changes in the game. And the second issue is how does tit for tat ever get the upper hand over strategies like always defect We've discussed this before, but tit-for-tat is a conditional strategy. 
So it starts out by always cooperating on its first encounter with any other strategy, but then its second move depends entirely on what the other player did. And this means that when tit for tat meets always cooperate, always cooperate also cooperates and they just continue to cooperate. But when tit for tat meets always defect, on the first move, always defect wins. But every additional move after that, tit for tat plays defect as well. But in that relation, always defect always starts out ahead from that first encounter. And so Axelrod's argument is, in a universe of just two strategies, tit-for-tat and always defect, if we start out with nothing but tit-for-tat strategies, then an always defect player cannot successfully invade, and that is because it can only win the first round. So we get this new mutation to a defector, and the defector can win the first round against tit-for-tat, but after that it can't get any further, and the tit-for-tat players, meanwhile, are playing cooperate with one another, and so they outperform the always defect. There's also the argument that Axelrod made that under certain conditions, tit-for-tat can successfully invade a universe of meanies, like always defect. Axelrod famously argued that tit-for-tat had four qualities that made it a winner. And one he called niceness, and this means that tit-for-tat is never the first player to defect. It always starts by cooperating. The second quality called generosity, and this means that tit for tat isn't trying to destroy the other players, but it's trying to cooperate with them. And it doesn't always have to win in order to come out and be successful in the wrong, long run. Thirdly, uh, tit for tat will play defense so unlike always cooperate, tit for tat will punish defection, and that's very important when it meets a meanie. And fourth, a tit for tat is obvious and transparent, and because the other players know what it will do, they will cooperate with it if that is their intention. But what's the catch with this uh, winning strategy? Well, Axelrod argues that tit for tat can only do so well against always defect when the, the shadow of the future is large, and it has to be sufficiently large to allow tit for tat to outscore always defect. And if you want to know how large does that have to be, read this book, which is the most significant contribution to the study of reciprocity in the 20th century. We conclude from looking at reciprocity that cooperation depends upon the answers to two questions. One, who are your neighbors? Are they cooperators? Are they a conditional strategy like tit for tat? Or are they all meanies? And secondly, what is the likelihood that you will interact with them? So if you're a cooperator and you can avoid the defectors, you're going to do fine. If you're a defector and you can't find cooperators, you're not going to do nearly as well. So this gets us interested in the different mixtures in these strategies in different human societies and how those different mixtures work out over time. If we assume that all of the individuals in those societies are more or less playing repeated prisoner dilemma games with one another over and over and over again. Thank you uh, so much for listening.